Thank you so much. Um, good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. A very warm welcome to our panelists and participants for the session on powering jobs, building the energy access workforce of the future to accelerate universal energy access and create jobs. I'm Suranjana Ghosh and I represent Power for All, where I'm the Global Director of Partnerships and Campaigns. Over the next hour, I'll be taking you through Power for All's Powering Jobs campaign. I'll be joined by my colleague in research, Austin Carbo, who will share findings from our latest global census on jobs in the decentralized renewable energy sector. And we'll then be talking to an eminent set of DRE experts from the Global South, who I will be introducing to all of you shortly. I'd like to thank the Sankar Global Summit and IntelliCap for giving us this platform and our funder, Get Invest, for making this session possible. Uh, Get Invest is a European program which supports investments in renewable energy. The program targets private sector business and project developers, financiers, and regulators to build sustainable energy markets in developing countries. The program is supported by the European Union, Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands, and Austria. Next slide, please. First, for those who are less familiar with Power for All, we are an international organization that focuses on the good of energy access. We emerged from the energy sector itself in 2015 and started to focus on getting the ecosystem to work together and grow the market for distributed renewable energy to end energy poverty. Our mission is to mobilize the network of energy access ecosystems that will help transform the way energy is being used, generated, and paid for to end energy poverty faster. Next slide, please. So a little bit about powering jobs. We came to do the study on powering jobs for one very clear reason. We found that the diversity of jobs in the sector was really not being understood the way it needed to be by government and development sector partners. There was no data to be had in the early days of Power for All, so we decided to take the initiative to investigate a ground up, statistically relevant approach to see what kind of jobs are being created alongside the achievement of energy access itself. And to help showcase the decentralized renewables employment data for its potential in helping achieve you know, both United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 7 and 8, 7 being the access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all, and SDG 8, uh, the SDG for providing decent work for all. Next slide, please. So a brief overview of what we're going to cover in today's uh, presentation on the census before the panel discussion. In 2022, we've conducted the Powering Jobs Survey across four countries in Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, Ethiopia, and in India. Today, we're going to speak with uh, DRE experts from Kenya, Nigeria, and India. So we'll actually get to see a little bit of the unpacking of what the census has also brought to light. We're going to talk about the Powering Jobs campaign goals, the global context, the research scope, and some of the estimates, trends, and key insights for the sector, especially on what jobs in the sector are going to look like post the pandemic and what lies ahead. We encourage you to drop in your questions. We'll answer as many of these as we can at the end of the panel discussion. Next slide, please. Power for All works in a community of action format, so we've created a multi-stakeholder community that's supportive of the Powering Jobs Initiative, and I'd like to take a quick moment to thank all the organizations that have helped make the census and campaign possible. In addition to our very generous funders, the Rockefeller Foundation, Good Energies Foundation, and Get Invest, I'd like to thank our survey and research partners as well, PLAS, Gobla, AMDA, Shortlist, APSIA, Ashton, Carrier, Unria, Clean Technology Hub, Ethioserve, Clean and CEW in India. We really could not have done this research without a networked approach in bringing together information from more than 350 companies in Africa and India and inputs from our global and in-country steering committees. Next slide, please. I'm just going to speak very briefly about the Powering Jobs campaign context um, before we get into the actual launch of the report. We know that we need more companies to address energy poverty, and most of us understand that this is no more a technology problem but it's a distribution access and implementation issue, which ends up usually being a manpower or a human resource issue. Our numbers back this up. We know that about 4.5 million jobs can be created by 2030, and the goal is to have jobs and energy access face each other equally. So we have the talent pipeline in place, which we need to be able to end energy poverty. 
And through this Powering Jobs campaign, we aim to build awareness, advocacy, and activation. So awareness in the sense that we'd like to use uh, DRE as a jobs engine, demonstrate that this is a really strong jobs engine that's worth investing in, both by developing and disseminating credible evidence. Advocacy, which would be around expanding the training for DRE and education with increased financial policy and programmatic support and activation, which is mobilizing the ecosystem, speaking with people like you to support DRE jobs, including uh, the ease of doing business for DRE companies to be able to drive jobs. Next slide, please. Some quick high level findings before I hand over to my colleague, Aus, who will unpack the research findings in more detail for us. We see that the sector itself has proven to be resilient through the pandemic, which is great news. It's created stable jobs. There is a gap in training programs, which we talk about more in the course of the session today. And some of our panelists will also probably be able to shed light on that. It's critical to know that women participate more in this sector's workforce as compared to the fossil fuel industry. We still have a distance to go in terms of DRE jobs and emerging economies, but it's a good opportunity for all of us to take on board all of these discussions, the gaps, the opportunities, and figure out a path forward that prioritizes training and development. So we are building a robust energy access workforce. Next slide, please. And before I hand it over to Aus for findings from the report, I'd like to acknowledge the research team at Power for All for their fantastic work over the past few months in the census. Over to you, Aus. Okay, thank you, Sue. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining. I am Mautin Carbo, a research manager at Power for All. Uh, I want to also thank the, the broader research team for all the work during this last year. And I will walk you through our main findings in the Powering Job Census 2022. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is our main findings. Most of them are great news, but there are also a few challenges. So we found that there is a lot of job creation in the sector and the sector is also helping to end energy poverty. We found that the DRE sector is a super resilient sector uh, and has proven to be during the pandemic. Then we also found that DRE training and talent is crucial uh, to achieving SDG seven. Solar home systems, uh, SHS, and also Pico Solar appliances are driving employment in Africa. And finally, we do want to see an increasing in human engagement in the sector. We are still uh, far away from, from parity, but uh, there are some lessons, lessons learned that I want to share with all of you. So next slide, please. Okay, in terms of scope, uh, this is our second census. In the previous census, we had three countries, India, Kenya, and Nigeria. Now we are adding two more countries, Uganda and Ethiopia. So in total, there are five countries. Uh, we are measuring direct employment, uh, and this is for the period 2019 to 2023. So uh, the, the survey was done at the end of 2021. So the first three years are actual data points and 2022 and 2023 are projections. This is direct employment and that means formal, informal, part-time, full-time contractors, any type of employment uh, directly related to a DRE company. This does not include uh, productive use of energy. We understand that the contribution of DRE includes productive use of energy, but it is a, a completely different discussion. We are just measuring direct employment. We also include four different, uh, four different technology types, uh, Pico Solar, Solar Home System, Commercial and Industrial Standalone Systems, and Mini Grid Systems. In terms of methods, uh, this survey is a bottom-up count over a representative sample of firms. Okay, so we did primary collection data. We received more than 350 responses overall. And we complemented all this information with focus group discussions. And also we interview experts. Um, next slide, please. So um, in terms of DRE sector numbers, which is our uh, main contribution in order to fill the gaps existing in the, in the literature, uh, we found that for example, in India, there are more than 80,000 uh, people directly employed uh, during 2021. And for Nigeria and Kenya, almost 50,000 of people employed. Just to give you a reference, for example, in Kenya, the largest utility company, KPLC, Kenya Power and Lightning Company, employs during the same year less than 8,000 of workers. 
Uh, this is our first time that we have numbers for Uganda and Ethiopia, and that's great news. <clears throat> and in those, in those uh, countries, the size of the markets in terms of sales is smaller, so that's why the number of people employed is also smaller. From focus group discussions, we understood that also in Ethiopia, probably we, we, we have some underreporting of informal employment, and also it's, it is quite common in that country to outsource sales uh, into smaller companies, which if they are not uh, DRE companies, obviously we are not counting them because this is just direct employment. The second important contribution from this slide is that you probably see a lot of green. And this is, again, great news because most DRE jobs are formal in all countries, but Kenya, and we are talking about five countries that have large informal economies. So this is, again, great news. Obviously, this could be related to an underreporting of the, of the companies, uh, of the informal jobs, and also related to COVID-19 because uh, formal jobs are uh, likely to survive crisis versus informal jobs. Finally, when we compare both the total numbers and the shares to the previous census, we realized that the three countries, um, India, Nigeria, and Kenya, have improved. So uh, that's the clue that probably something good is, is happening in the sector. Next slide, please. OK, in terms of trends, our main question here was how fast the sector recovers from COVID. And we found that all five took ahead. We found that the DRD sector is a super resilient sector because it performed better than the overall economy in each of the five countries. Just to give you an example, the three largest countries in terms of employment, so this is India, Kenya, and Nigeria, are fully recovered from COVID or are about to be uh, in 2021. In order to understand the trends, we created three different archetypes. So the first one is a strong and immediate rebound from COVID-19, and this is for Nigeria. Nigeria had a massive growth before the pandemic, and um, the pandemic only slowed down a process that was already occurring in the country. As you can see, the employment number for Nigeria from 2021, it's already above the pre-pandemic levels. The second archetype is a slow but a steady rebound, and this is for Kenya and India. So we can see that both countries lost uh, jobs during 2020, but we expect to be at pre-pandemic levels or higher during uh, the end of this year, 2022. And finally, the no recovery yet archetype, and this is for Ethiopia and Uganda. Since 2019, we haven't seen uh, employment, employment growth in the sector yet, but we still say that it is a resilient sector because when you compare uh, the performance of the dairy sector during the pandemic and you compare that to the overall economy, the sector did much, much better in terms of employment during COVID. Next slide, please. Okay, so just sharing some, some findings regarding the workforce. Uh, first, skills, then I'm going to speak a little bit about training and finally about women's participation. We divided the total workforce in, in three categories following the ILO definitions. So for each country, we have skilled, semi-skilled, and unskilled workforce. We found that except for Ethiopia, the unskilled uh, labor force accounts for less than 25% of the workforce, which is uh, really low. Um, also in India, the skilled labor force is more than 70%, which is a lot. And uh, in Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda, the skilled labor force is around 50%, with, with what again is a lot uh, compared to the overall economy. We also found that the skilled shares correlates with uh, the maturity of the sector. So this is because larger systems such as commercial and industrial or mini grids require more advanced technical uh, skills. Next slide, please. Then regarding training, uh, we basically look at two things. So in the bars, you will see the hours of training, internal and external training. And in the bubbles, you will see the share of companies that provide any type of training. And we found that more than 50% of the companies in the DRE sector provide any type of training, which is great news. 
we found that uh, there is a significant variation between countries when you look at hours of training. So, for example, the average worker in Kenya receives 120 hours of training per year versus only 50 in Ethiopia. And uh, we also asked the companies to identify the main barriers in order to provide more training or uh, to provide any type of training. And the companies identified the lack of financial resources, the shortage of quality training programs. Obviously, this is for external training. And finally, the low tenure as the main barriers to provide training. The last one, the low tenure, it's uh, in a way it's good news because it shows the willingness to invest from the companies to invest in their workers if they are going to stay. Next slide, please. Okay, and finally, um, the, the DAD sector, women's participation and the, the shares goes from 21% uh, to 41%. This is India and Kenya respectively. In Uganda, 28%, Nigeria, 35%, and Ethiopia, 37%. We, when we compare these shares to the previous one, we realized, I mean, the previous census, uh, we realized that Kenya and Nigeria improved since our last census, which is great news. And also we realized that these shares tend to mirror those of the overall economies in each country. We found an overrepresentation in, from women in administrative functions, such as assistants and office management. And we found an underrepresentation in top management, leadership, and technical positions. Some great news regarding, regarding women is that uh, the wage gap in the DRD sector is smaller than the wage gap in the overall economy. And we also find an inverse correlation between participation and wage gap. So this is, for example, in assistance where you have lots of women, the wage gaps tends to be uh, smaller. Next slide, please. Okay. Finally, uh, this report finds that the DRD sector is a large, stable, and resilient employer in sub-Saharan Africa and India. It is large because it creates 374,000 of jobs across Africa and more than 80,000 of jobs across India. It is stable because these shops are mostly formal and it is resilient because it has been less affected and it is recovering faster from COVID. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm happy to take any type of questions at the very end. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much for taking us through the presentation findings, Aus. And um, uh, once again, um, just want to uh, mention how privileged we are to have uh, our panelists today, and I'd like to introduce you to all of them. Uh, without further ado, I'll begin with Ola Symbol Shojiri from uh, Solar Sister. She is a gender and energy expert uh, who's the chief operating officer at Solar Sister, where she leads a network of women entrepreneurs distributing clean energy products uh, in underserved communities across Nigeria, Tanzania, and Kenya. She's the current president of the Women's Consortium of Nigeria as well, and is an Acumen West Africa fellow. And um, move on then to Bankole, who is the CEO of the Nigeria Climate Innovation Center, a climate technology partnership program of the World Bank with the government of Nigeria. They focus on the growth of a viable green economy in Nigeria. Bankole also specializes in entrepreneurship and business development and innovation management. I'm going to move on to Andrew. Uh, welcome, Andrew. You're the CEO of Kenya uh, Renewable Energy Association of Kenya. Andrew is a senior leader in the environment, renewable energy, and energy efficiency related sectors. He successfully set up an energy service company, taken part in the development and implementation of energy efficiency projects, and made significant contributions in building sustainable energy policy for public and private sector organizations. Uh, Abhishek, Abhishek Jain is fellow and director of Powering Livelihoods, a council for environment, energy and water at CEW in India. Abhishek has built and leads the council's practices on energy access, rural livelihoods and sustainable food systems. Abhishek is also a Shedling fellow and he directs Powering Livelihoods, which is a $3 million initiative to transform India's rural economy with clean energy solutions. Uh, welcome to all of you and um, we're really privileged to have you all join us today for today's panel discussion. 
Uh, I'd like to begin today's panel discussion by mentioning the three themes that have kind of emerged from the research that um, our team just spoke about. And these are around training and youth, uh, building a favorable growth environment for the DRE sector and gender and youth. So in terms of training and youth, uh, we are looking at creating a meaningful career path to attract talent and youth into the DRE sector. In terms of building a favorable growth environment, we'd like to look at the role of public and private enterprises in fostering DRE adoption. How do we build job growth? And finally, how do we also create economic stimulus? And the third is gender and youth. Uh, the opportunity the DRE has to create um, gender work to create and break uh, gender workplace rules and create more gender parity. So the questions that you'll see me asking our panelists would be around these themes. And it'll be great to understand what this actually looks like on ground in the areas that you work in. So my first question is to Andrew on Kenya's regulatory environment. Um, Andrew, you've also been part of our steering committee for um, Kenya, and we've seen that the DRE sector has shown great resilience in the face of COVID-19 with jobs opening up in 2021 and now surpassing you know, pre-pandemic levels in most of the survey countries. My question to you uh, is, and what do you think about this trend and what regulatory frameworks are in place in Kenya that are supporting this growth? And are there any gaps and how can those be um, filled? Uh, thank you, Soranjana. I think uh, one of the things that has enabled the growth of uh, distributed renewable energy has been deliberate policy, number one, to include um, off-grid solar as part of the national electrification strategy. But even that was informed by, in the first place, having the solar PV regulations from as far back as 2012. They were enacted in 2013. And these automatically created the demand for um, people to be registered, and then once they were registered, trained, and licensed, then that created opportunities, particularly for the commercial and industrial, but also for the solar, uh, the Pico systems and the solar home systems. Having standards in place and having a financial system that uh, Paygo created meant that it required to have people with prerequisite skills. And because their skills were required to be able to just operate, then the statutory environment gave rise to a lot of uh, opportunities. So I think in terms of the gaps, uh, we look at it beyond solar. Of course, solar is the dominant source, but we also look at other areas and we still have some uh, gaps to fill with areas such as uh, biogas, where we have standards for the dome systems, but we don't have standards for the prefabricated systems. We are also looking at having um, qualifications for these other subsectors to be able to have um, an minimum requirements that can further help to grow the sector the way that it did with solar. There's also the financial systems. I think that's a big part of contributing to the job opportunities and the more flexible op uh, terms with these energy types creates even more jobs. So I think that area is under development. We've just developed the biofuel guidelines and that will go a long way in terms of opening up for investment and uh, creating more opportunities. Right. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. And I really feel that that uh, correlation between making uh, between unlocking finance and actually helping the sector grow is kind of a reciprocal process because that's really how both the jobs are created as well as being able to absorb people who are skilled enough to take those jobs and eventually achieve energy access. So thank you so much for uh, shedding light on what it's like in Kenya. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, Abhishek now. And Abhishek, again, this is a question on the regulatory environment and jobs potential in India. 
um, and um, especially in terms of the impact both pre and post pandemic. Now we see that India is a mature industry, and uh, this is shown by the high percentage of formal jobs. And uh, we also see that the technology is moving more towards larger DRE applications, uh, solar pumps, um, mini grids, rooftop solar, and the like. Now, what measures do you think have been in place in India that impact this change? And what could be some of these lessons for other emerging markets in Africa that you can share? Thanks, Ranjana. Uh, if I have to talk about, I mean, you started with the resilience of the sector. I think uh, certainly uh, you see that the jobs are sustaining themselves uh, despite the uh, pandemic. Uh, but uh, uh, as you also rightly pointed out, uh, slowly the sector in India is moving towards larger and larger systems. Uh, be it rooftop solar, be it uh, decentralized renewables for livelihood applications, be it solar pumps, uh, and so on. And that's where we're going to see the next phase of growth, uh, in my opinion. Now, what has led to this uh, sort of systemic uh, evolution, I may say? Uh, first is a clear government signal, I think much like uh, Andrew said, uh, a clear government policy and consistent government support goes a long way in creating uh, and shaping the market. Uh, India is one of the first countries which embraced solar water pumps uh, and has done it in a big way. Uh, it is still the leading country in the world with, uh, in terms of the number of solar water pumps that are deployed. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, Indian policy on this front, I mean, we started uh, providing some, uh, government support back in 2015 itself, 2015-16. But uh, since 2018-19, there is a dedicated uh, program uh, which runs into a multiple billion dollar uh, to provide uh, support for large-scale deployment of solar water pumps in the country. Uh, we have a target of deploying about 2.5 million solar water pumps uh, in the next two to three years. Now, that kind of directional support, uh, when it comes from the government, not just in terms of policy, but actual budgetary allocations, uh, that is what helps uh, create an ecosystem of uh, entrepreneurs and enterprises, which are then uh, catching on to these opportunities and trying to develop their solutions, develop their distribution channels, develop their uh, customer interface and artificial service support, etc. So the first is really, uh, in a long run way I'm saying, a consistent government policy support backed by the actual budgetary allocations. Uh, because policy in many countries is the intent, but once you have the money allocated, that is when you see the uh, shift happening. And we have seen that at the sub-national level in India as well. Uh, states which had uh, more consistent policies and more uh, long-term support for solar water pumps, they have done far better compared to the states where the policies were not as consistent. Uh, a small state in India, Chhattisgarh, uh, which has uh, less than 4% uh, of India's agriculture area, has more than a quarter of India's entire solar pumps, just because the policy has been consistent uh, for the last several years, uh, almost now last 4-5 uh, years, uh, for them to consistently uh, deploy more and more solar pumps. Uh, the second thing I would say uh, is to uh, create an innovation ecosystem uh, because a lot of these new age technologies need support in terms of uh, not just lab scale innovation on the technology front, but also innovation with regards to business models. So how do you create that uh, ecosystem where innovations can be enabled, where risk capital is coming in, be it from the philanthropy, be it from the public sector, which is uh, letting innovators and entrepreneurs to take their risks. Uh, I think that is uh, the second uh, main area which uh, India has done quite well because of the general ecosystem of innovation. And there are a lot of uh, learnings that are emerging from there. There are a lot of incubators and accelerators now who are dedicatedly focusing on running cohorts of enterprises which are focusing on uh, DRE, which are focusing on uh, some of these social challenges uh, and how to solve those social challenges with clean energy solutions. Uh, but when I talk about innovation ecosystem, uh, I'll try to now stretch it beyond the innovation part and talk about the ecosystem that is required to translate these innovations onto the ground in terms of large-scale deployments and large-scale mainstreaming and commercialization. Now that needs an uh, ecosystem in itself. That needs an ecosystem of end-user financiers. That needs an ecosystem of skilling and training uh, enterprises or uh, institutions. That needs an ecosystem of uh, uh, those who can provide uh, livelihood uh, related support to the end uh, users and enterprises. Uh, now, those who are actually adopting these solar water pumps or a solar uh, milling machine or a solar cold storage, they need to create viable businesses and livelihoods out of these. Now, to create those viable businesses, you need to have a skilling support, uh, end user financing support, uh, as well as uh, market linkage support so that you can create those viable. So, uh, 
at one end creating innovation ecosystem at other end creating an ecosystem so that these innovations can be scaled on the ground i think both of these are equally important uh, and to just uh, sum up i would say as uh, you would realize that uh, we move from smaller systems to larger systems the ecosystem uh, the conditions within which we need to work also evolve what do i mean by that uh, a solar lantern is a product where you will see lot of volume and it is a low value product so the kind of sales channels you need the kind of uh, skilling you need for your uh, employees is very different compared to uh, a solar milling machine you are not going to sell a solar milling machine to every household so it is not a game of volume but rather a game of value so what kind of after sales service network what kind of sales network you need also evolves what kind of end user financing partners you need also evolve so i think those are the things where india has now built uh, a level of uh, knowledge and understanding that could certainly go in, in a long way in at least reducing the learning time for many of our african uh, countries to mainstream these solutions let me pause there and i'm happy to come back again Thanks so much, Abhishek, and I, I really like that point. I mean, I think also the idea of having a conversation like this is to, you know, really listen from you know Andrew Olas and Bobankode and you and understand, um, you know, what's working in each of your countries so that you can actually reduce that time of that learning cycle and um, you know not duplicate maybe the efforts that have uh, taken people a while and a distance to uh, get where they are right now. So thank you for that, and I completely agree on the point of uh, you know building the innovation ecosystem. in pace along with the end mile um, you know financial inclusion piece as well and something very similar to what andrew mentioned too i'd like to move on to ola singo and this is a question on the women's participation in direct employment within the diary sector piece now uh, ola singo solar sister works in so many regions across africa on empowering women entrepreneurs in the solar industry and you are obviously very familiar with what's working on the ground challenges you know and again what needs to change in order to increase that participation of women in the workforce now in this report we've seen that the percentage of women remains persistently low in the sector so what are some specific measures that you know governments companies um, even training institutes can take to bring gender parity into solar jobs thank you so much thank you for having me um so yeah um uh, you know according to let's let's start with the africa development market bank i mean they they said that eliminating gender inequality and empowering women could raise the productive potential of 1 billion africans delivering a huge boost on the continent's poten- um, development potential so there is a relationship between gender parity and actually sustainable development or or even just development in africa so this 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 um, relationship is very clear um and governments are aware of this um you know it it's it's clear in market activations governments are looking at how to tailor the specific needs of their country um when it comes to um energy and, and solar jobs so um for nigeria for instance i know we have this um solar power nigeria program which has an aim to electrify 5 million of grid nigerian households and they're doing this through solar home systems and mini grids and this is um, a program that we at solar sister are also part of and i know other governments um like Kenya um and in Uganda are also doing similar things to ensure um that there is increased participation and that they're also focusing on this gender parity but i wanted to focus on training because this is an important area where um i mean a lot of um, private companies have already recognized this and are doing this um but this is a, an area where government and um and training institutions i think can do more um because what we need the the workforce that we need for green jobs um we really need them trained we need them skilled um and we recognize that we want um you know we want women's participation across um the entire value chain and from your report you've also said that you know the off grid sector the the lower skilled or unskilled part of the off grid jobs we see that women participation is is there but there is that gap um for the skilled labor for women in leadership and i feel like training institutions and and universities um can do um uh, can do more um in in this component um at solar sister obviously this is something that we recognize 
we are training women in underserved communities a lot remote. Um, these are, you know, the populations that are usually left out. Um, and we are um, coupling our model with training, not just on green, 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 um, how to run a green business, but also on the personal agency and the things, um, the, the skills, soft and hard that they need to grow um, in this in, in this field. And lastly, I wanted to talk about girls in the STEM field as well. We know that um, these are our future engineers. These are our future leaders um, in, in the energy space. And there is a need now to start focusing on girls, even um, in schools, to ensure that there is exposure um, to this field. So um, I'll stop there. But these are just some of the practical things that we can do to increase um, gender parity in the solar industry. Thank you so much, Ola Simbo. And I think, uh, you know, the point that you made about the combination of both the hard and the soft skills, I think is really important because um, once again, I think we have a fantastic opportunity over here to bring in gender parity in the, into the sector, creating this entire career pathway for women who might not have even considered DRE as a career option. And this is true of, you know, all the countries, um, you know, that we've done the survey in, we'd really like for powering jobs to be that sort of jobs engine for women, which, um, you know, all of these economies need. My next question is going to be to Bankole on uh, Nigeria's uh, regulatory environment and how can this foster uh, favorable growth for companies and in turn create more jobs. Uh, so Bankole, um, we know that Nigeria showed the most impressive growth in jobs and recovery from the pandemic. It's expected to, uh, to grow even further by 2023. And the sector is poised to create more than twice the number of DRE jobs uh, that were created in 2019. So what measures have the government, uh, public and private sectors put in place to spur this growth in Nigeria? Uh, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think that the Nigerian government, uh, which again, I'm not a spokesperson for the Nigerian government, but from what we have seen so far, um, the Nigerian government has, uh, you know, has created some form of a support structure for uh, renewable energy businesses, um, you know, the powering jobs or, you know, power, the Power Africa uh, program in Nigeria sort of, you know, creates that nexus where uh, this is government investors all can work together um, so that the kinds of finance that is needed to scale this economy, uh, you know, is largely, uh, uh, you know, understood by all the players within that space. Um, I think the, the Nigerian government also has leveraged on, uh, you know, renewable energy as its, uh, you know, as its basic technology for, uh, you know, for energizing, uh, far, you know, far communities, uh, underserved communities. So we have an organization in Nigeria called Rural Elect Electrification Agency. Um, and I think that the REA has leveraged on solar um, so much that many times people think they are called, you know, Renewable Energy Agency of Nigeria. Uh, because again, that showed that that showed that with the kinds of infrastructure challenges that uh, remote and underserved communities are facing, um, solar or off-grid or mini-grid, um, you know, uh, businesses have been able to some extent fill in that gap. And so, what the government keeps doing is to create much more opportunities for more businesses to scale within the sector, um, support other investors like um, all on. Um, uh, you know, and, 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 and co to be able to um, uh, create more finance opportunities for Bankole, I think we lost you there. For ventures, mostly mini grid businesses, just on uh, big. All right, I think we've lost Banco Leader because Building he's in and also, transit. Uh, Banco Leader, we, we can't hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. Banco Leader, I'm uh, sorry, but we can't hear your audio. Yeah. Maybe if you speak now, we'd be able to hear you. Nope, still can't hear you. I know you're in transit, so maybe that's why the connectivity is patchy. Okay, I'm going to come back to you and I will... 
I'm going to address my next question to Andrew. Andrew, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Andrew, I wanted to understand from you, what are some recognized training programs uh, for those interested in building a career uh, in the decentralized renewable energy sector in uh, Kenya? And uh, how is Kenya working to uh, build the training ecosystem in Kenya? Uh, thank you. That's a really good question. I think beyond or over and above all the courses, the technician skilled worker level one, that's uh, T1, T2, and T3, are by far the most um, advantageous courses that have been available. Those are the ones that allow for those who install solar home systems that are on DC um, systems, but they also can upgrade and that's what has been the progression that you start with a T1, then you go to T2 and to T3. So when you get to T3, which is the grid connected systems, then there's now a shortage of available trained and licensed uh, practitioners, whereby you find for a number of the companies that are doing this either as a service or doing outroad sales end up having a waiting period because there are few technicians and uh, they are occupied uh, for a lot of the time. So as Korea, we've seen that we need to expand the training both horizontally and vertically. We need to have higher level of uh, skills at all levels, whether it's from uh, the top level of PhD in renewable energy technologies. We are partnering with the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology to promote master's in master's degrees in energy technologies. But at the same time, we know that a lot of these skilled jobs require support from lower level um, entry level or lower level skills that are maybe some manual. I mean, you're not going to install rooftop solar panels without somebody that's going to actually climb and fix the panels on the roof. So you might have the people that are doing the designs. If you look at the companies, when they advertise, they will talk about the engineers, but the gap is who's actually going to climb the roof, who's actually going to be able to do that kind of work. And then there's less uh, obvious uh, support skills that are still also needed. So what we're doing is to start to recognize all the skilled workers, regardless of the, the level or advanced level of study, because they are all an integral part of it. Without them, we don't have a system. And to do that, we want to expand the training opportunities. We have created a platform that allows for collaboration. So within the same ecosystem, you can be able to map end to end the skills that are required for a project. You can be able to see the visibility of the skilled people where they are, because that's another challenge that we have a concentration of skilled people in Nairobi, but not that many projects in renewable energy. And then we have people that have prerequisite skills in the different counties where the projects are, but they don't have the specialized training that would be required for this project. So we want to push that training to them. We want to do it online. We want to turn training upside down from being something that is available to the elite to something that is readily available to anybody that wants or needs that kind of training. And then we also want to devolve the practical training through our relationship, similar to what was being discussed in Nigeria. We also have the Rural Electrification and Renewable Energy Corporation. They now have 16 energy centers in the counties. So we want to use those energy centers as training and a place where people can also be able to find the technologies that are available in the country. We did a study in uh, productive use of energy 
in Kenya, a baseline study looking at the solar sector. And one of the recommendations was that before introducing new technology, you need to train people. So you need to train people on these technologies and then let them be the ambassadors. And we also want to have it, I mean, it's said all over the world, we are saying it right here, that renewable energy creates jobs. So we do want to see that in practice. And with this platform, we are now able to track and to um, monitor and see the impact that, say, policy is having. We always ask for some tax exemptions and we say they create jobs. So we are now able to see the visibility of these jobs. We are able to support them to upgrade and to link these job prospects to project developers and to investors. So that if you're doing a 30 megawatt project, then we can be able to say not that there are enough people, but we can tell you their name, their location, their qualifications, their interest, um, all in one ecosystem. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew. And I think, um, you know, a couple of those really interesting points that you made, the democratizing of access to uh, training, I think is really important, as well as the decentralizing of training, because that just kind of helps create more jobs along more jobs and training along the entire value chain of DRE jobs. And also the readying of a workforce so that the technology is actually then um, implemented in the right way. So that's exactly the point we're also trying to make through the Powering Jobs Report, that the pace of training needs to be in place with the uh, provision of access, energy access. Uh, and staying on the uh, theme of training, my next question is to Ola Sindhu. And um, since Andrew also made this point on, you know, taking training to more remote areas. Uh, so Ola Sindhu, what do you think, uh, you know, are some ways in which the youth of the African continent can be provided uh, with DRE as a career pathway, as well as developing a you know, skilled pipeline of human capital uh, for these energy access jobs? Um, yeah, you know, they say Africa is the continent with the youngest population worldwide. Um, as at last year, 40% of our population is actually under the age of 15. Um, and compared to the, I think the global average is 26. So um, the youth population, I think that's, that, that is a, a resource that we have um, in abundance. Um, and I always say, I said the youth, they are the energy that we need to power the energy sector um, because it is pertinent for us to build their capacity and take uh, for them to be able to take advantage of the green jobs that we have all said is imminent. Everyone is saying renewable energy is the future and they are right. We're having, um, you know, we say there's a climate crisis that has prevent, presented this opportunity um, for so many green jobs. We've seen a lot of decommissioning. We've seen um, of organizations that are even, even, you know, the traditional oil and glass companies that are actually switching um, to more renewables. So there's going to be a lot of jobs projected. Um, and it's this young people um, that will take up those opportunities and we need them to be skilled and we need them to be African. Um, I think we, you know, something we can learn from the oil and gas, especially in Nigeria, where that was a big um, source of funding is a lot of the juicy jobs went to expatriate. Um, and we've seen this, we can learn from that, and we will change that um, by upskilling our youth right now um, to, to ensure that they have the necessary skills that they need to take up this job. So I think that that's really important. I know that there's been the Off-Grid Talent Initiative that has trained quite a number of um, energy practitioners across Africa. Um, I know that um, AMI, um, that's the Africa Management Institute, um, was involved in training that Solar Sister benefited from. Um, for mid-level managers. And that gave us the opportunity to build the capacity of our own team, mostly women, um, 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 to be able to um, function in this, to retain this talent that we have um, in the off-grid sector. And I feel like there needs to be more. Um, this is one organization doing this, um, but there needs to be more of sub such upskilling We've already alluded to the fact of um, institutions, universities and training institutions 
actually focusing on this. And I'm, I really like what Andrew said in Kenya, that there is a, a particular um, curriculum already for that. And other countries need to follow suit. We need to continue to build um, this opportunity. Um, and Solar Sister Kenya, which was formerly Livelihoods, is also focused on youth, um, youth engagement, in the off-grid sector, in the um, underserved um, communities, upskilling them with the skills that they need um, to distribute um, a range of clean energy products. So we can't um, overemphasize the need to build the capacity of our populations, of our youth, of our young women, and of our girls in STEM, you know, 15-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds trying to make that decision of what career to do. This is the time to push them. This is the, you know, we're saying that this is the future. This is this is what, this is the area that they need to concentrate on to be able to take advantage of the jobs in the future. Um, so, yes, I think these are some things that we can do. Um, and there's always room we can do more. Great point, and especially in terms of ensuring that, uh, you know, upskilling also means that uh, all jobs uh, go to Africans across the entire spectrum of jobs. And um, staying on that theme, I'm going to ask my next question to Abhishek. And again, uh, this is building on the Atmanirbhar Bharat uh, story as well, right? I mean, which is self-sufficient for those of you who don't follow Hindi. Um, it's self-sufficient India. Um, so, uh, in your experience, again, and with CEW's experience, Abhishek, what are you seeing in terms of, you know, entrepreneurship? Uh, in the uh, in the DRE space and uh, both to address the demand for jobs as well as the supply for jobs. How can we make the DRE sector grow in terms of entrepreneurship in India to provide that, um, you know, to provide that base for jobs? Yeah, so that's a um, big challenge in general, like how do you create uh, entrepreneurs uh, uh, at scale? I mean, of course, uh, uh, there are unicorns getting um, uh, built out from India every now and then. Uh, but uh, we need many more, uh, what I would say, uh, good horses rather than a few unicorns. Uh, we need millions of horses, right? So uh, I think on that front, uh, what uh, uh, really helps is to create that ecosystem where uh, you are enabling, uh, you are allowing for failures to happen because entrepreneurship does mean you need to take different kinds of risks. So how do you create uh, uh, spaces, safe spaces in, in the form of either some kind of resident entrepreneurship programs or some kind of uh, uh, salary while uh, a first time entrepreneur is trying to venture out uh, just so that uh, they know that they have a safety net to fall back on. Uh, I think many times those small uh, things do uh, go a long way in uh, creating that space for entrepreneurship. Uh, the other challenge that we see is like uh, in a typical uh, innovation cycle or an entrepreneurial journey, there are usually two values of death. The first is the technical value where you are not able to convert your idea to a technical feasible prototype. And the second is the commercial value of death where while you have a technically proven solution, you're not able to create a product market fit or a product which is then desired by the customer at the price point at which you are providing it. Uh, and we see that a lot of the entrepreneurs struggle at that second stage. Uh, many of them are able to move forward and come up with technically robust solutions, but are struggling to sort of take their solutions to market at scale. And that's where even some of our efforts in the last uh, three, four years uh, in the form of running this parking library program has been to uh, provide both technical and uh, capital assistance to such entrepreneurs and enterprises, uh, allow them uh, patient capital so that they can try out various things, uh, but at the same time, keep a dedicated focus on commercializing these solutions at scale on the ground uh, and handholding them in the process, how to figure out your marketing strategy, how to figure out your sales strategy, etc. So, so entrepreneurship does take a lot of uh, patient uh, support, I would say. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight, so you need to work as an incubator accelerator with these enterprises for long enough. Uh, before they can uh, start uh, sustaining themselves uh, in a profitable manner. Uh, and in the process, how do you convince policymakers, how do you convince investors, and how do you convince financiers to support the ecosystem uh, in the long run? Uh, because without the, these three coming together and supporting, uh, you're not going to see entrepreneurship uh, happening at scale. Uh, that's what I would uh, uh, add in terms of uh, entrepreneurship mainstreaming. Thanks so much, Abhishek, because we do understand that, you know, the more entrepreneurs and the more roles that are created in the sector will actually lead to more jobs. So thank you so much for that. And I'm uh, going to move on to Bankole and uh, hope that he is in a place where he has stable connectivity, because I do have a couple of really interesting questions to ask him before we wrap up this session. Uh, so uh, Bankole, um, are you able to hear us? Yes, I can hear you. 
Okay, great. So, um, would you like to complete your answer to the previous question first, and then I can ask you the next one? They're both kind of related, so I'm just going to repeat that question. It was uh, on the impressive growth uh, in jobs and recovery um, in Nigeria. Uh, in the DRE jobs, and so um, you know, what measures? Uh, my question to you was on what measures that the government has taken, or the public and private sectors have taken, uh, to spur this growth. Related to that, we also see that in Nigeria, the number of jobs actually match those in the oil and gas sector, and uh, they're currently uh, estimated at around sixty-five thousand, and also expected to grow. So, what can we do to you know sort of sensitize uh, the youth or you know other people looking for career options? That this is a stable career pathway, um, so that we are also able to drive further growth of jobs in DRE in Nigeria. Sorry, it's a really loaded question, but simply because we're running out of time, <laughs> okay. and I finally have you with connectivity. So over to you. Yes. So, um, so I think that with the with the partnership of the government with private sector to leverage a lot on um, solar technology or renewable energy technology, has sort of you know boosted uh, you know that economy beyond beyond what it used to be three years ago. Um, so um, after the lockdown, what we saw was a shift, you know, was a shift in, uh, you know, you know uh, uh, request for knowledge, right? And so uh, you have more organizations like A. Stevens and Co. Uh, doing, doing things that are focused on, uh, on building capacity and, uh, you know, improving how more young people can have access to, to this technology and this knowledge. And so, with agent, with um, organizations, for, you know, such as us, out incubation programs, you know, uh, you know, doing some rapid prototyping, we're seeing more and more young people, you know, delving into that part of renewable energy. And then you have, you know, the part of, uh, you have the part of, uh, you know, um, uh, players who are who are sort of carrying out, uh, you know, ad ad advocacy, who are sort of carrying out advocacy. That is, you know, that is sort of improving how, uh, you know, more and more people can have access, uh, you know, to training centers. Um, like, um, like uh, Simba said earlier, um, you have more oil companies really advocating, you know, in a very absurd manner about how young people should, you know, should look into the renewable energy, uh, you know, uh, sector, and also uh, support SMEs, you know, rural rural communities. So I think that the message is really clear. And um, what many Nigerian youths are seeing is that this is a valid alternative economy, not just an economy that sort of rivals the, the fossil fuel economy, but also an economy that shows rapid growth, that shows strength, that shows, that shows uh, you know, uh, um, access to uh, a lot more possibilities. And so I believe that uh, with all the co you know collective efforts that we're all doing, you know, with, with centers like like NCIC, um, you know, Solar Sisters, and um, quite a, yeah, and other plethora of uh, of uh, renewable energy focused. Um, in another two years, we will see that the the renewable energy uh, sort of will definitely surpass. Um, uh, you know the oil companies. You know even banking and co. Uh, because if you look at the innovation space, um, what I found as an as an innovation manager is that software development was sort of like the big focus five years ago, right? It is still a very huge focus. But we're also seeing that the software group or rather community or ecosystem is also seeing that there's a huge role they have to play in the renewable energy sector. You know, from designing payment platforms, you know, to designing energy efficiency systems and co and uh, even even monitoring systems so you see that um the re the access the need for access to energy has sort of opened up a whole new list of opportunities for um either either uh, singularized skill set owners or a sort of like a corporate uh Okay, like, we've lost know, one skill, skill set owners. And then you uh, also okay, Bankole, I think we're losing you again, and we're also almost can you, can you hear me? yes, yes, Bankole, we can hear you, but you're it's very patchy. We're also almost out of time. We're in the last minute, so I'm really afraid I'm going to have to wrap up the session here. Okay, uh, I'm just so, yeah, in, and it just go ahead, please. I it, it keeps it keeps breaking. Sorry about that, Bankole. Um, 
but I'm just going to try and throw open this question that we have from the audience because we literally have time just for one before I wrap up. Uh, what can be done to help increase sensitization of alternative power that would drive young people to be involved and create job opportunities? So uh, if I could um, throw that open to any of our panelists who'd be willing to answer that question, who'd like to take that? Andrew, would you like to take that? Uh, yes, sure. I think for me, and we had this discussion yesterday, we need to have markets. When we have markets for goods, for services, for green products, then we create jobs. Africa has the capacity to be able to meet a lot of global manufacturing using renewable energy. If the West, if the North starts to buy these products, then you drive up the demand and you create jobs for um, for people same with import substitution. So I think markets will drive the job opportunities. Thank you so much for that. And a big thank you to all our panelists, to Simbo, to Andrew, to Abhishek, and to Bankole. Um, and of course, to all the people who made this uh, session possible, to all my colleagues at Power for All, as well as to our funders, and to Sankal and Intellicap. Thank you so much for joining us today, and hope you found this session uh, engaging and useful. Thank you. Bye-bye.